Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Tell me, why are clinical trials important? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably two main reasons. Number one, it provides us with the evidence base we need so that we know that our management decisions are based in fact and not in, you know, anecdote or fiction and so forth. But I think, and, and you touched on this a little bit, one of the other important reasons is if we go back to the late 80s, let's say, when we didn't have these large scale randomized clinical trials in glaucoma available to us, insurers started to ask the question, well, we're paying you to do all of these tests to study whether glaucoma is present or whether it's progressing, yet we don't have any real good evidence that what you're doing to treat glaucoma actually does something, even though we've used medicine to lower pressure, and then at that point in time, lasers to lower pressure for a long period of time, we still didn't have that great evidence to tell us that it was actually useful. So that's where many of these clinical trials that showed the utility of lowering intraocular pressure was actually useful, became really handy to say to insurers, yeah, what we're doing makes sense, and we really do have to do this testing. So I ask, always ask the question, what if the answer was actually no, and it didn't show that lowering pressure meant anything, then everything would be a crapshoot. And, you know, we wouldn't be doing the testing that we do or the treatment that we do. So really important stuff. You know, it's, it's really interesting because if, the, if it would have came out that lowering intraocular pressure didn't work, you know, we would have had, you know, almost 100 years of treatment uh, that we've been doing that would have been worthless. All that pilocarpine would have been, uh, it would have been used for nothing. So, yeah. You know, and I think before we go over the clinical trials, I think it's important to note that a lot of the clinical trials were done before OCT and, and, some, of the, and some of the newer medications that we use. But in a way, it's not really the point because the point is we want to know if lowering pressure in a lot of these trials worked. Yeah, I think the big thing with no OCT is OCT is more sensitive than certainly in eyeballing optic nerves, even stereoscopically, OCT is going to be more sensitive in detecting progression. So when we look at progression rates in some of the studies, we might anticipate that the progression rates would have been higher if OCT were available. That said, you know, when we're looking at quality of life relationships in glaucoma, we're really often looking at visual fields. And that hasn't really changed all that much in the last you know, number of years. I know when we worked together back at SUNY, you know, we were doing a lot of Goldman fields, or we had the, we were around in the early days of Humphrey visual field analyzers, where we had no statistical analysis, where we were, it was kind of a crapshoot trying to determine actually what we were looking at, looking at rather. So, you know, that's where we stand right now, but I think your point is well taken about OCTs. I want to ask you if you could help the audience know what is exactly keratoconus? Keratoconus is a, a non inflammatory, at least uh, that's what we believe, non inflammatory condition of the cornea, where over time, for reasons we don't fully understand, uh, the corneal integrity is, is uh, diminished. 
And so there is warping of the shape of the cornea due to weakening of the, um, of the structural integrity of the cornea. And that warping then can cause decreased vision. It can cause distortions in vision. Initially, it can start with uh, uh, increasing in nearsightedness and then increased in increase in astigmatism. And ultimately, the astigmatism could be so severe and the warping could be so severe that it could lead to scarring um, and, 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 and uh, loss of vision. So tell us what pellucid marginal degeneration is. And is there a difference? Or are they really the same disease? Well, they're both part of the kind of the same, they're cousins, so in a, in, a, in a way. So it's really kind of based on where the thinning or the warping occurs. Pellucid marginal degeneration is a condition that uh, similarly, there's warping of the cornea and thinning of the cornea, but with keratoconus or classic keratoconus, that thinning occurs more centrally or just inferior to the central cornea. With pellucid is more closer to the periphery. And so the, sh the way the warping occurs is, is different. Um, the other thing that differentiates the two is that keratoconus often occurs at a younger age, whereas pellucid manifests itself at an older age, typically. Um, keratoconus, there's been associations with um, uh, eye rubbing, uh, other conditions, uh, allergies, Down syndrome, um, uh, and Gloria can chime in too. There's been associations to keratoconus that pellucid is less well understood, right? Because it's not as common as keratoconus. Completely you know, agree. Uh, I, I just called it a disease. Is it a disease or is it a degeneration or do we not know? Well, it's, it's I guess how you want to define disease and degeneration. It is, it's a, I, what would you say, Gloria? I would think it's, it's both. I would say that both conditions, keratoconus and pellucid are corneal degenerations, but it's also a disease. So yeah, I would say both. It's a corneal disease. I and mean, one, one thing in, it's in the case, in the rare case that it's associated to Down syndrome, that's, um, uh, um, it's an association, not necessarily, I, I personally believe because of potentially related uh, eye rubbing and, and laxity of, of, of the lids and such, it's hard to understand exactly why it's associated. Um, there's, it's also some association to col um, collagen vascular diseases and such. But um, when I think about disease, I think more of a systemic, I suppose, I guess you could call it a corneal disease. It is more specific to the cornea. So let me ask Dr. Chu to jump in here for a second. What is form frost? Uh, so form frost keratoconus, it's, it's very interesting and it's very difficult to find. As Dr. Shami said, if pellucid is rare, this is even more abnormal to see in clinic. It's essentially defined as a cornea that really has no abnormal findings when you're using your normal equipment in clinic, like your slit lamp, and corneal imaging like topography, but the other eye, the fellow eye has clinical keratoconus. So you'll see um, the bulging of the cornea, you'll see thinning, you'll see distortion in the cornea, but the other eye, it's not as obvious. So, you know, we know that keratoconus is a bilateral corneal disease, but one eye tends to be affected more than the other. So the form first tends to be more in the minimally uh, affected eye is, I guess, how I would so say it. So it's yeah. kind of like an incomplete phenotype expression. We, 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 yeah, we, or, or it could also be considered a kind of a, because keratoconus is a progressive, progressive condition, uh, there is a start to it. And before it becomes clinically um, detectable or clinically relevant or symptomatic, there are certain signs that are mild and, and, and often require advanced imaging technology to be able to detect. And so form proofs could also be kind of early keratoconus that can yeah. evolve into keratoconus. Absolutely. And it becomes a real important issue, especially in a refractive surgical practice, where one of the biggest um, uh, kind of challenges in, in uh, offering surgical um, options to our patients who are seeking refractive surgical um, options to have freedom from glasses is to be able to detect form fruits keratoconus, to detect yeah. that kind of early signs of keratoconus in a 20 some year old who may not yet have manifestation of the disease. 
why do you so why do you think that there's not enough cataract surgeons in other parts of the world and why aren't people getting cataract surgery yeah so here in the united states cataract surgery is a highly technologically dependent surgery we use a sixty thousand dollar ultrasound pro probe the tip of which vibrates forty thousand times per second to liquefy and emulsify and suck out the cataract we often use diamond blades or a million dollar laser to make the incision to prepare the cataract for surgery and it's an expensive surgery it costs roughly two thousand dollars insurance pays for it but it costs roughly two thousand dollars to fix a cataract in the western world and cataract surgery techniques were developed in that setting for those people. Um, for those for people overseas who make you know, $5 a day, a $2,000 surgery is utterly beyond their reach. And so for the longest time, there wasn't anything that we could do for people who had cataracts in the poorer parts of the world. Roughly 10 or 15 years ago, that all changed. In engaging enterprises, in enterprising doctors all over the world, collaborating on the brand new internet without corporate or industrial or government support reinvented cataract surgery. They said, hey, take a look at this. Instead of using that million dollar laser for an incision, we can make an incision with a 25 cent blade. Instead of using a, a, a $60,000 ultrasound probe, we can pop the cataract in, out in one piece using a little needle that we bend in the shape of a fish hook. And they reinvented, reimagined, re-engineered cataract surgery and made it accessible to the world's poorest people we can now do cataract surgery at a cost of roughly 30 000, of roughly 30 dollars per case and it turns out that that manual low-tech cataract surgery works every bit as well especially in advanced mature cataracts of the type that we see overseas as modern techniques as western techniques so now all of a sudden over the last 10 years we've had access to a new cataract surgery designed for the world's poorest people and accessible to the world's poorest people. The job now is to bring that surgery to those people, to build the capacity, to develop the skills in people who didn't learn that skill, and to expand the reach of cataract surgeons to the people most in need of it. And that's what, uh, that's what C International, the charity with which I work, seeks to do. So what does M6, what does it stand for? It stands for Manual Small Incision Cataract Surgery. When I was training, I guess, 35 years ago, we would make a big incision and we'd pop out the cataract in one piece, but, but we made an incision in such a way that we'd have to put in four or five stitches afterwards. And we used to tell people, don't bend over, don't lift anything, you're gonna pop a stitch. And it would take weeks, sometimes even months before people could see well. Um, about 10 to 15 years ago, these uh, really enterprising third world doctors who had gotten tired of telling their blind patients, that there was nothing they could do because they couldn't afford a $2,000 surgery, reinvented cataract surgery. They modified the incision, made it broader, made it stable. Um, they developed techniques for popping out the cataracts through a smaller incision. And in doing so, they created a surgery that takes 10 minutes that can be done at a material cost of roughly $25 to $30. And that appears to work every bit as well as modern Western techniques as we use them here in the United States. I would add that when this, when this first arose, when these surgery techniques arose, nobody in the United States believed it. We all thought, come on, that can't be right. That can't be right. $30 for a cataract surgery. And, um, and nobody was going to believe it unless a randomized clinical trial was done. And so my friend, Jeff Tabin, who's a professor at Stanford and who was one of the developers of this technique um, invited his friend David Chang, who's one of the United States' most famous and most prolific of cataract surgeons, to come to Nepal. And they trucked along his FACO machine and his microscope and roughly $100,000 worth of equipment. And they brought it up to the top of a monastery with some trucks and some yaks. And they sat him down next to Sanduk Ruit, who was Nepal's most famous cataract surgeon and an adherent to this manual small incision technique. And they sat the two doctors down, one next to each other, one doing a $2,000 per eye surgery, the other one doing a $30 per eye surgery, and randomly assigned patients to one or the other. And it turned out that for the advanced cataracts that they see in Nepal, the uh, manual technique was quicker, the re visual recovery was quicker, and at six weeks, the two eyes were equivalent. Um, the manual technique worked every bit as well 
as the fancy, highly technologically dependent techniques that we use here in the United States. It's also worth noting that it's not uncommon when I'm operating overseas for the lights to go out. You know, power is something we take for granted and it's awfully periodic in certain places in the world. Um, when the electricity goes out, you can't do modern Western cataract surgery, but you can sure do manual cataract surgery. And when the lights go out overseas, all the nurses take out their, their cell phones. Everybody's got a cell phone. They turn on their flashlights and we get right back to work. Um, I've often, I've seen doctors in Africa turn on their car and run a, run a wire from the car battery to the microscope. And they can do, if they have a light, they can do cataract surgery with the manual small incision technique. Here in the United States, without power, there's not much we can do. <laughs> we just shut it down if the power ever goes out. Of course, it doesn't go out in the United States as it does over there. But yeah, it's a technique designed and evolved for the world's poorest people that, that offers us a, a path to the end of needless blindness in the world. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, about your uh with Mr. Beast, your your segment with Mr. Beast, and 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 later in the show, but I it's funny. I had a patient who saw that Mr. Beast segment that you did, and he asked me, "Why don't we do that type of surgery in the United States? Why are yeah. we doing Why are we doing the two thousand dollars surgery?" Right. So the answer is, we operate on the United on cataracts in the United States pretty early in their course. Um, a cataract in the United has states has the has the consistency of like melted ice cream. Um, it's not rock hard, it's kind of soft and mushy. And the techniques we use here were designed for those kind of cataracts and they work best for those kind of cataracts. Um, as you might imagine though, if you have a rock hard cataract, one that's the consistency not of melted ice cream, but the consistency of a marble, it's really hard to emulsify. And it's, and it's not all that safe to spend all that energy within the eye breaking up a rock hard cataract. So the techniques that the cataracts that they see overseas, people who are completely blinded by cataracts, um, Western techniques don't work all that well, and their techniques work better. Their techniques are better for their cataracts. Our techniques are better for our cataracts. And it makes sense here to do um, ultrasound techniques, techniques that use a tiny incision. It's worth adding, and I didn't mention this before, there's a little bit less astigmatism induced with our techniques than with theirs. So if your goal is 20-20 vision, is perfect vision, our techniques are a little bit better. Over there, though, there's no 20-20. There's can you see or not? Can you see to walk around? Can you see to take care of yourself? Can you see to feed your family? And if you're 20-40 after cataract surgery, having been blind the day before, that's a success. Over here, <laughs> people have more expectations and, uh, and they're unhappy people who are 2040, if they have a little astigmatism and need a pair of glasses after surgery, um, there's a different set of expectations and, and therefore the two techniques diverge. Um, having said that, I do, if I see a really advanced cataract here in the United States, I'll do an M6. Um, it works great and it's a better way to do an advanced cataract. And how about anesthesia? Uh, when does the anesthesia apply with M6 when you're in the yeah. third world? When does I travel apply? overseas, we don't bring an anesthesiologist with us. And people are wide awake. Their eyes are numb. We numb their eye with either with drops or with an injection, but they're wide awake. And it's amazing. Nobody ever moves and nobody ever complains. You can hear them whispering prayers. You can hear them you know, uh, talking to themselves, but there's never a, a, there's never a complaint. Here in the United States, we have an anesthesiologist at our side. We give an IV, we give some sedation. We often give some pain medicine. People wiggle a little bit. If they feel anything, they let me know. They're sure to let me know. So again, there's a different set of expectations and a different, uh, a, a, and a, and a different uh, goal. Over there, they know this is their one shot. And they, and they know life is not free of pain. Um, that there's supposed to be some pain in life. And so um, and so culturally, they're accustomed to holding still when the doctor tells them to hold still. Um, the United States, for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, consumes, I think, 80% of all the pain medicines in the world. Um, and uh, and we have this understanding that, that, that we should never have any pain. And so we use anesthesiologists. The anesthesiologists are careful to assure that the surgery um, is painless. Often we give people sedation that makes them half asleep during surgery. 
it's a different expectation and, and it's cultural it's um and it's not it's outside of my realm of expertise other than to say that over there people do great without it and here they need it macu health your science born and tested solutions for visual performance macular degeneration and dry eye syndrome new products coming soon embrace the science What is macular degeneration? Yeah, it, it's great to tease it down to what exactly we're talking about. So the macula is the part of our retina where we get our central crisp best vision, our 2020 vision if we have if we have normal vision. It's also one of the most metabolically rich portions of our whole body. So your macula and the photoreceptors, there's a high metabolism there. So it's constantly producing energy and getting rid of waste, waste products. And that whole process takes a lot of metabolic function. And macular degeneration is with time, so time is one of the main risk factors, that that metabolic process breaks down. And it breaks down because of a buildup of what we call drusen. And drusen is basically very similar to cholesterol. It is a cholesterol, similar to the cholesterol that can build up in our arteries. So it's, 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 it affects so many folks. Right now, uh, over 11 million Americans have macular degeneration. It's the leading cause of vision loss for those of us 60 and older in the US and the leading cause of, of vision loss worldwide for ages 50 and older. So do you think macular degeneration is an epidemic now? You know, um, I believe it's an epidemic when we're talking about aging and vision. When we think of epidemic, right, we think of pandemics, we think of the myopia epidemic, where we know by 2050, 5 billion folks worldwide will have um, myopia and be at risk for that disease causing vision loss. So the numbers are certainly high. And when we look at all those things that we worry about in our aging population, our glaucoma patients, our diabetic patients, and like you said, you add up a patient with those disease conditions, a little over 2 million for glaucoma and a little over 7 million for diabetic retinopathy, it doesn't even equal what those at risk for vision loss from AMD. So it is kind of, it, it's a very bit large call to action. It's not the big numbers like myopia, but it certainly is one that every primary care practice needs to be hands-on and, and keep up to date with. There was an article in Survey of Ophthalmology back in 2010 by Denoso, and he said that macular degeneration is a systemic disease. And I think that's really fascinating because when we look in the eye, because we have such great technology, we could tell a lot about the eye and we could diagnose close to 300 systemic diseases from the eye. If you could comment about that. Yeah, um, it really is because we see the risk factors for macular degeneration, like we said, is mainly time, but cardiovascular disease and diabetics are at a higher risk. And obviously those are diseases that affect our whole system and our vasculature system in particular. So it really is a disease that we find in most of my patients that go on to advanced macular degenerations have the comorbidity of cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and especially diabetes. And as an optometrist, where do we fit in? We, we are the quarterback. So, you know, I always explain to my patients, um, you know, that topic will come up. What's the difference between optom optometry and ophthalmology? What are our roles? So I tell my patients, your optometrist is your quarterback. We deal with five ophthalmology colleagues that we love, our surgical colleagues that we co-manage, and we, we farm you out to those folks when you need it, and we'll co-manage your care, but we're the quarterback. And the quarterback, the most successful quarterback, knows when to throw the ball and when to not throw the ball. And optometry is actually more important because we see our patients, you know, at our practice from cradle to coffin. So we know them for years and years and years. And so when I can educate them about conditions they're at risk for and then be that quarterback and not only help prevent conditions, but then have advanced technologies when they do convert, that I can keep them in house and watch them as closely as possible for better outcomes and not have to um, you know, have them farm out to our retinal colleagues is the whole goal. One of the most interesting statistics that people don't realize is about 50% of the population will suffer from some eye disease at some point in their life. So making the eye exam 
you know, it's more than just eyeglasses and checking for contacts and eyeglasses. If you could expand on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, at, at the beginning, you said there's nearly 300 diseases in the whole body, many neurological diseases that we can detect in the eye. And so really looking at the patient as a whole, you know, we see from young to old in our practice. So we start talking about how your eyes are connected to the rest of your body. You didn't come in bringing your eyes in on a tray for me to evaluate, right? They're connected to everything. And the, so it's so important to maintain good general health so that the eyes and vision stay healthy for as long as the patient needs them. And hopefully that's for a very, very long time. So, so speaking to the patient more than just about vision serves two purposes in our practice. Um, it, it Obviously we want the best visual outcomes for our patients, but when we're talking about the things in their body that could put them at risk for vision loss, it opens up that whole discussion for lifestyle. What do you eat and how do you move your body? And those are discussions that optometrists need to start having regularly with our patients because think of the, the um, presbyopic tsunami right now. You have the oldest millennial turned 40 last year. So that's prime presbyopic years. I bet you that many of those, we know statistically, many of those millennials have not been to see an eye doctor because if they've seen great all their life, they weren't highly hyperopic or myopic, they never saw the optometrist, but guess what? Now that they're on their computer, cell phone, and tablet, and they can't read anymore, whose doorstep do they show up on? And what a golden opportunity for us as primary care folks to educate them, not only about that near blur, but now that you're 40, and then 50, and then the next decade of 60, when your risk for disease increases, namely AMD, you know, we're going to have those discussions early on because we know if we can identify and prevent disease early on, our visual outcomes are just going to be better. You know, I've worn contact lenses for many years, and I know you've worn contact lenses since you're a child because you have a very bad prescription, a very high prescription. Is contact lenses really a miracle? You know, I would say so. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and you say any any patient that that wears contact lenses themselves, uh, you know, I imagine that they would agree with that statement. Um, you know, we, we really think about how much uh, contact lenses can really make a difference in someone's lives, whether it's emotionally, whether it's giving that patient confidence, um, not only just the gift of sight um, as well, um, but overall, um, when we, we look at the data and it showcases that that patient's confidence uh, increased. Um, when, especially when we look at children, um, when they are, you know, leveraging contact lenses. Um, but I'll say it's it's pretty remarkable, though. Um, you know, I, a little backstory on myself is, you know, I got my first pair of contact lenses uh, 25 years ago now, which is hard to believe. And you know, when I I had that first opportunity to put contact lenses on, uh, it, it changed my life. It led me down this path to become an optometrist. And it's hard to believe that at 13 you kind of know what you want to do when you get older. Um, but I can say that. Um, truly, it was that moment that I put a contact lens on, went out onto the baseball field and realized, wow, I had this full peripheral vision. Gone are the days of my thick brown glasses at, uh, as a, a minus six at that point, which is really highly nearsighted, even for a 13-year-old. Um, and then to really be able to you know, utilize uh, the, the gift of contact lenses uh, throughout the rest of my life. And uh, now I feel like I've been given the opportunity to showcase the world how awesome contact lenses really are and how um, I think that that many more patients could truly benefit from uh, the miracle of what contact lenses really are. You know, we're very lucky in the United States because I interviewed Dr. Jeffrey Levinson, who does cataract surgery around the world and, and you know, third world countries and very poor countries. And oh, after 40, they can't even, there's no glasses there for these people. So people who read up close and then there's not even glasses for these type of for these type of people and they become disabled. So if they were, they had a job where they were sewing or they were making things with their hands, they can't even see it. But in the United States, we have contact lenses. We even have contact lenses for people that need bifocals, right? Yes, it's pretty remarkable. Um, you know, we we like to think about it as, you know, we have contact lenses to help children um, who are progressing in myopia um, with uh, myopia control contact lenses, all the way to patients that have astigmatism. 
uh, all the way to even patients that need both contact lenses to see off the distance as well as up close. Um, so I, I like to think of most refractive errors, uh, there are contact lenses to meet those patients' needs and, and to wear them comfortably and, and in a healthy modality, healthy manner as well. You know, I feel that the best way to wear contact lenses is single-use contact lenses. You wear them once and you throw them out. You know, unfortunately, I'm old enough to remember the days where people had one pair of contact lenses for the whole year. And we used to have all these infections in the eye. People would get corneal ulcers and people even, you know, went blind from contact lenses back in the day. But the studies show that single-use contact lenses are by far the safest way of wearing contact lenses. And they even make single-use contact lenses for people that need bifocals have, or have astigmatism. It, what would you say about that? I would say if, uh, you know, when we look at the overall modalities, I, like you said, that there used to be yearly ones. Um, there are daily disposable, they're two-week, they're monthly. I'd say those are like the most common. Um, but where the, where myself as a practitioner and a number of our colleagues are going, um, or that what we're seeing is that daily disposable or the single use contact lenses are now being prescribed more than any other contact lens modality out there. And patients are looking at it as such a great option, uh, especially for the convenience that we are looking for in our really fast lives that we live. Um, so we can have all the technology that we were once used to that were only available in maybe yearly or monthly or two week lenses now available in these single use lenses that you literally put a fresh pair in each and every single day um, and you, you toss it when you're done. And, you know, to be able to have um, that convenience and, you know, the freedom and flexibility of prescription parameters not really being uh, an issue either. Um, I would say if you haven't had the opportunity as a patient to experience daily disposable yet, I would highly, highly encourage you to talk to your eye care physician uh, about them. You know, I think one of the barriers always was cost because single use contact lenses are typically a little more expensive than the two week or monthly lenses, you know, and, and I lecture to other doctors on contact lenses in the past, and I would always say to them, you know, what is the most common contact lens that you fit on your patients? And, you know, about a third of the people would raise a hand for two weeks, and about a third of the people would, doctors, these are doctors, raise a hand for one month, and about a third of them would raise for daily. And then I would say to them, for yourself and your family, what kind will you fit? And they all raise for daily. So, you know, so they're somewhat concerned about how much the patient has to pay. Yeah. And you know, when we, we look at having conversation with patients, um, patients, they, they want to hear of the latest and greatest technology. They want to hear of the options that are out there. Uh, and, you know, talking with my colleagues, um, it's just introducing technology, uh, daily disposable technology to patients. And, you know, when we look at even how contact lenses are even manufactured, the manufacturing process is that much more efficient, that much more cost effective as the, um, than, the, than it used to be as well. Uh, and so the barrier of cost, um, I, and I think you can uh, agree with this, Dr. Gelb, is that uh, the barrier of cost has uh, really dramatically decreased, uh, especially once an individual has an opportunity to, to try out the daily disposable technology of putting that fresh lens in each and every single day. Um, they really find the value of what a uh, single use contact lenses really brings to their lives. What type of modality do you recommend? Do you recommend dailies, two week, monthly? What type of contact do you typically recommend for your patients? What do you think is the best way to wear contacts? Yes. Uh, again, I've, I've been a very early adopter to the one day disposable type contact lenses. Um, again, like I stated before, our practice is approximately 80 to 84% of our patients wear one day throwaway contacts at this point. Um, and, uh, you know, most certainly they, they've come a long ways, the technology, the, the, the reasons, I guess I always tell patients, I've got five reasons that I look at of why I would fit you in a certain type of contact. And, uh, the first reason is always what, what is the ocular health? Uh, and, and not just short-term ocular health care, long-term. I'm not fitting this patient just for one week or one year or two years. 
some of these patients may be in contacts for 30, 40 years. So that's a piece of plastic on that eye for many, many years. So, and by far what I've seen in, you know, in over 35 years of practice, and I've seen contact lens on, on eyes every day of my life, the, the people that's, that wear the one day disposable certainly have the, have the healthiest eyes long-term. So the second factor we look at is what, what gives, what provides the most clear, clear vision or best clarity. And again, because the daily disposable does not get as dirty and dry and deposited, so I teach my patients the three Ds, 3D vision, dirty, dry, and deposits. We can eliminate dirty, dry, and deposits that then we could probably perform better optically. And then the third reason be comfort, you know, what feels the best on the eye of that patient. You know, we'd like to have that, that lens feel very comfortable for when they put it on in the morning. I hope they can just forget about it and not feel it all day long and then just be able to throw away at nighttime. And then the fourth reason would be uh, our reason what, or why we fit contacts. Uh, it would be convenience. Um, certainly the dailies, because we don't have to do any cleaning, becomes more convenient in most people's busy lifestyles today. And then the fifth factor we look at is, you know, what, what's the cost of the contacts? So, and, and I'll always tell patients, you know, the, the, the cost of the daily disposables, it, it, it may be more, but, but what do you get? What do you get for that? What's the value proposition? And the value that people get from those other four factors of the best eye health, the best vision, the best comfort, and the best convenient will usually outweigh the cost at that point. A lot of times patients will ask, when should they remove a contact lens? You know, if they're walking around during the day and all of a sudden, when it's a definite time, they have to take the contact lens out and either give their eyes a break or actually call their doctor and be seen. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today.